Good evening. Welcome to our midweek Bible study. We're in the Gospel of Matthew on Wednesdays, and the last time, a couple weeks back, we finished with the Magi coming to the baby Jesus. Tonight, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 2. We're going to finish chapter verses 13 to 23. And so let's open up in a word of prayer. Father, we do come before you, and we thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We thank you for your grace, your love, your mercy, Lord. And God, just the things you continue to reveal to us, your children. I pray for tonight's teaching, that you would anoint it, that you would bless it, God, that you would speak to us, Lord. God, that you would give us a hunger and thirst for you and for your word, especially to know what your word is saying to us, Lord. And God, I just thank you for the opportunity that we can gather through the internet here and have fellowship with one another in the spirit. Bless our time now, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 2, verse 13. <clears throat> Now when they had departed, speaking of the Magi, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord, through the prophet saying, out of Egypt, I called my son. Now, Matthew is making an important point here. Christianity is not just something to have. It's, it's not just something that we do as Christians. It was founded by God a long time ago. And it was actually brought into fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ. These scriptures are a link between the Old and New Testaments. I mean, they show that the New Testament is in the Old, concealed, and that the Old Testament is in the New, revealed. It's in the New Testament, revealed. And by Matthew quoting the Old Testament, as well as so many other writers do, that actually make up the scriptures, the Word of God, we're being taught how biblical prophecy should be understood. I titled the message tonight, Prophecy and the Fulfillment of It. By Matthew quoting the Old Testament, he quotes a lot of prophecy that is being brought out in the New Testament. I mean, when most people think of prophecy, they think of specific clear predictions of some future event. Sometimes prophecy is exactly that, like the prophecy updates I do. <clears throat> I tie in Ezekiel 38 and 39 with what is going on in the world today, especially with Russia, Ukraine, Israel, Iran, China. Guys, things are ripping. They're ripping at warp speed, man. I'm telling you, Jesus is coming. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be incredible. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 6, the religious leaders quote Micah 5.2, showing where the Messiah will be born. It's interesting that they would quote this because they could care less. They could care less about the Messiah being born. It says, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, land of Judah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me, the one to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth are from of old, from everlasting. Now, here's the key. Nowhere will you find a clearer, more specific prophecy of the Messiah being born in Bethlehem. That's it right there, Micah 5.2. The other prophecy is found in Isaiah 7, 14, and Matthew quotes it in chapter 1, verses 23. We already covered that. But there are those who aren't sure as to whether it's a prophecy just about Jesus' birth without reference to anything else, or 
is somehow linked to another normal birth in Isaiah's own day. Well, this is only one type of prophecy. The Old Testament sacrificial system is an example of another type. For instance, the writer of Hebrews argues that the entire sacrificial system pointed forward to what? Jesus' death for our sin. It was fulfilled by him in the atonement. We learn how the Mosaic law anticipated the gospel, how the Levitical priesthood pointed to a new high priest. You know who that high priest is? Come on, the great high priest, Jesus Christ, sitting at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you and me. It pointed to a new high priest who would stand between God and man and never need to be replaced. I mean, the Levitical priesthood, they kept dying. So when they died, they would have to replace it with another high priest. Jesus never needs to be replaced. It never needed to be replaced. It, it talks about how David's kingdom served as a model, or I guess we could say type of the kingdom of God how certain covenants had a process that led believers to look forward to the promise of the new covenant. We read in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 and 34. Listen to what God says. I mean, this is cool. The New Testament. It's, he was talking about the New Testament. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I, God, will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with them and their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke. Though I was a husband to them, says the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law on their minds and write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor. That means I'm gonna be out of work <laughs> teaching the gospel. And every man his brother saying, know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, I will remember no more. No mas, ya stuvo. I mean, it's finished. It's a new covenant. The covenant we have in salvation through the blood of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, it's important to understand these general types of prophecy. I mean, many of the ties between the Old and the New Testaments are, are usually general in nature but they're not less significant than the specific ones. In fact, many of the Old Testament quotations in Matthew have to be understood in this way. Tonight I wanna to look at three Old Testament prophecies that cover the years between the coming of the wise men to worship Jesus and John the Baptist coming on the scene as Jesus' forerunner in the beginning of chapter three. They're about, number one, the family escaping to Egypt. Number two, Herod's murder of the children in Bethlehem. And number three, the family returning to Nazareth. Joseph, Mary, and Jesus returning to Nazareth. Herod must have thought he was on top of his game. I mean, you know, this guy was crazy. He was insane. Here he's asking the Magi to come back after they found the child, so that he could also go and worship him. I mean, I would have been thinking, are you kidding me? <laughs> are you kidding me? I mean, we know he had no intention of doing that. Herod wasn't gonna do that. Herod wanted to murder the child, the baby Jesus, because Jesus was a threat to his throne. He was a threat to his throne. When he realized the wise men had outsmarted him, they said, you know what? We ain't going back to the dude, man. We ain't going back there. We know what's going to happen. 
Well, Herod was beside himself. I mean, he just went off the hook. He lost it. He tried to kill the child by murdering all the young males under two years of age. Can you believe that? Ruthless. But there's something we need to consider here. Neither Hosea 11 verse 1, which speaks of God bringing his son Israel out of Egypt, nor Jeremiah 31 15, which refers to Rachel weeping for her children, had anything to do with a future fulfillment. I mean, they're taken only as the past event had happened and taken place. But beside all that, there's also no reason why the killings of the male children should have been mentioned in any other writing. Herod wouldn't have recorded it because it certainly wouldn't have made him look good, for sure. Bethlehem was a small town with no more than a thousand residents. In fact, some Bible scholars or theologians say there could have been as few as 300 people in Bethlehem at that time which would mean there would have been possibly less than 20 or so young children. Here's what we do know. Something like this was totally Herod's character, especially in the last years of his life. I mean, when you study the history of, of Herod, the guy was always, always ruthless, ever since he was young. But in his later years, he just, he went off the scale, man. He just went off killing people. Think about it. He murdered his favorite wife, his favorite wife. <laughs> he had two sons strangled, two of his own boys. As a last act of loving, of long and violent career, he had Antipater, another son, executed for promoting himself to probably be his heir, to probably be Herod's heir, had him killed. The killing of the young children would have been a minor offense for the sinfulness of Herod. And because of this danger, God warned Joseph to take the child and his mother and split the Egypt, man. Get out of Dodge. You see, that's what I love about the Lord. He will warn us. He will warn us. But you know what? We have to be sensitive to the move of his spirit. If we're thinking of other things, man, I mean, how are we going to know if God wants to lead us one way or another way? We're not going to know. Egypt was a natural place for Joseph and Mary to go. Number one, it wasn't far away. I mean, the border was only 70 miles from Bethlehem. Egypt was a Roman province. I mean, it was actually beyond Herod's jurisdiction. It had a large Jewish population. Some believe as many as a million, according to Philo's writing about AD 40. Another plus, Joseph wouldn't have had any trouble finding relatives or friends in Egypt. He wouldn't have any issues with finding a job. So God knew what he was doing. You know, how many times do we question what God does? <laughs> I know I do at times. We question what God's doing instead of just trusting him because he knows the future and he knows exactly what's going to happen. This is where Matthew quotes from Hosea, out of Egypt, I have called my son. You know, but here's what's interesting. When you look at the verse in Hosea, you find that it's really not about the Messiah who would come. It's about Israel and God's deliverance of the people from Egypt. All the time, Moses leading them at the Exodus. That's what it's about. So, you know, you, you start to look at this and you're thinking, okay, Matthew, we got in mind. What are you doing here? Are you tweaking the scriptures? <laughs> what are you doing? 
Matthew knew Hosea 11.1 1 was about Israel. He knew that. But what he understood is something beyond a future prophecy. He understood that Jesus is the ultimate embodiment of Israel. Jesus is the one in whom is wrapped up all the true character and destiny of the chosen people, the people of Israel. The fact that Jesus was taken to Egypt and returned from Egypt was one of God's ways of showing you and me how significant Christ's ties with his people really are. This is what Christ does with us. Jesus does this with us. The context in Hosea's passage is not only the deliverance of the people from Egypt, but of God's faithfulness to them in and beyond Egypt, in spite of their disobedience. In other words, in spite of the times that we're disobedient to God, God is still faithful to us. He's still faithful to us because of his son, Jesus Christ. I mean, in the Old Testament, Israel was God's son. But Israel was a disobedient son. And by contrast, Jesus is a beloved son with whom the Father is well pleased. You see, and this is a contrast that Matthew is trying to pull out here. Look at verse 16, Matthew chapter 2. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry. And he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all his districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men when Jesus was supposedly born. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet saying, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. He's showing the contrast from the disobedient son, Israel, to the obedient son, Jesus. The wise men must have told Herod that the star had appeared more than a year before they came to Jerusalem because they would have needed time to get ready. I mean, they were heading out on a journey. They were going across a desert, man, so they had to get ready for that. Many believe this is where Herod got the wicked idea of killing all the males under two years old. He wanted to make sure it included this child who was a threat to his throne. Matthew then quotes Jeremiah 31. Now this is interesting because when we look at that scripture, we find the tears being shed are for those who are carried off in exile. The tears aren't for the family, who in a sense went in exile to Egypt, but for those remained behind and were slaughtered. Now, even though that could be a reason for tears, it's not a clear, obvious fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy. So again, what is Matthew doing? <laughs> what is Matthew doing here? Is he tweaking the scriptures to make them work for what is happening? Man, unfortunately, I know pastors that do that. It's unfortunate because they're going to have to give an answer for God. Everything I'm teaching you now, I will give an answer to God. That's why I have to study. That's why I have to research it. I have to make sure this is God's word. That's why James says, don't let many of you become teachers, for greater is the accountability. I, I am held accountable for what I'm teaching you tonight and on Sunday mornings in the Psalms. What Matthew is thinking and trying to prove, I mean, why quote a passage that doesn't seem to relate to this situation? Why quote it? Well, some believe the connection has to do with hope. Okay, Rick, what are you talking about? Now, now, now I'm losing it. I'm missing it. 
Actually, that's the message of Jeremiah 31. It's a message of hope. You see, at the beginning of Jeremiah 31, God says he'll continue to be the God of the exiled people. He says those who weren't killed by the Babylonians will experience his favor. He says his love is an everlasting love. And he says he will build the people up again. You know, that's encouragement to us because sometimes we can tend to stray for a while. Amen? Amen. Sometimes we can in our hearts, in our minds. God's still our God. He still loves us. He'll still build us up again. He's waiting for us. Verse after verse is speaking of Israel's future joy. I mean, they're referring to vineyards, flocks, herds, times of festivity. God speaks of gathering the people from the land of the north and from the ends of the earth. Then speaks of Rachel weeping for her children. You see, there's a promise that God will bring the people back to their own land. I mean, we actually saw it in our generation, May 14th, 1948. Since 70 AD, when Titus led the Roman army in and burnt down Jerusalem, the temple, tore down the temple stone by stone, we saw them come back May 14th, 1948. And when you get into Matthew chapter 24, which speaks of the last days, the end times, and into the great tribulation period, Matthew 24 says that generation that witnesses that are you guys listening to me? Will not perish till everything's fulfilled. We're that generation. I mean, May 14th coming up, 2022, it's gonna be 74 years that Israel's been in the land. How long is a generation? I don't know. But you add on to that 74 years, the seven year great tribulation period, which we won't be here for. We're going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb then for seven years when all hell is breaking loose, when God is dealing with the Jews, the chosen people, the Jewish people. A time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah called it. We're not going to be here for that. You add seven to that 74, that takes you to 81 years. How long is a generation? We got to be there, man. We got to be getting there really quick. He said that generation would not perish. They wouldn't die off until everything was fulfilled. Guys, it tells you how close we are. I mean, th I feel I have an urgency to teach God's word because time's at hand. Look what's going on in Europe. Look what's going on in the Middle East. I mean, Russia going into Ukraine, is God gonna, like Ezekiel 38, 39 says, put hooks in Russia and drag them down into Israel? And that war take place? And out of that war, the Antichrist sign a seven-year peace treaty? Well, before 2 Thessalonians chapter two tells us, before the Antichrist can even come on the scene, the church has to be gone. Do you know as a believer, you and I, are keeping the Antichrist from coming on the scene. <laughs> it's awesome, man. I mean, it's awesome. The reason, the only reason, for the reference to Rachel weeping for her children who had been taken into exile is the command to restrain from weeping. To restrain from weeping. I mean... Instead of looking back in sorrow, the survivors were to look forward in hope. They're to look forward in hope. You know, this study really helped me with mom's passing. You know, last Wednesday, uh, mom went to be with Jesus. And I mean, it really ministered to me. Instead of looking back in sorrow, and that's what we do with our loved ones. And our close relatives, our friends, our best friends who pass away. We, we look back in sorrow. It keeps us down. It keeps us defeated. We get weak, we, we get sick. 
what, we're sh what we should be doing is looking forward and hope. Guess what? Mom's in heaven. You and me are still here. We're paying bills. <laughs> we're taking meds. <laughs> She's blessed. We're the ones that are still here. <laughs> I'm looking forward and hope. Because as I study biblical prophecy, eschatology of the end times, I know how close we are, man. <laughs> There's a joy that comes with knowing we're not going to be here that long. In fact, most of us might never see death. We're going to be transformed. We're going to be raptured. We're going to be caught up in the air to meet our Lord. You see, there was hope for the exiles in Babylon because they would return to their own land. And there was hope for Israel because the Messiah escaped Herod's wrath and would return to his own land from Egypt. I mean, that's probably most likely what Matthew means as he quotes Jeremiah 31, 15 as a prophecy. He already made the exile a significant turning point in Israel's history. I mean, we read that in Jesus' genealogy in chapter 1, we covered that about four or five weeks ago, it's the break between the second and the third sets of 14 names in Christ's family tree. I mean, this is significant because the exile marked the end of the line of David's descendants who sat on the throne and ruled from Jerusalem. Matthew's making the point that the true exile, with his lack of a king like David, is now over because the true king, the Messiah, has arrived. Yours and my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's going to sit on that throne, man. Through that 1,000-year millennium, Christ is going to be reigning, and he's going to reign with a rod of iron. You get out of line, somebody gets out of line, the hammer is dropped <laughs> instantly. Praise God, we're going to have our new glorified bodies. We're not going to have these sinful bodies. We're going to have that new glorified body, and we're going to be reigning as kings and priests for a 1,000 years. Guys, that's just ahead of us, man. Think about it. If the rapture happened tonight, that war happened, Russia and Iran and, and the other nations coming down into Israel, and out of that war, it says they're gonna burn the weapons for seven years. That's how we know that that war is in right at the beginning of the seven-year Great Tribulation because Ezekiel chapter 40 to 48 is a millennium. Ezekiel is prophesying about the thousand-year millennium. They're not going to burn their weapons into the millennium. It's not the battle of Armageddon. It's the war that is about to take place. People are going to be shocked when it happens because they weren't watching. You know what? I feel like I'm a watchman, like God told Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 3 that if the sword's coming and Ezekiel doesn't warn the people, then God says your blood is, their blood's gonna be on your hands, Ezekiel. But if you warn them and they don't do nothing about it, then their blood is on their own head. It's up to me. It's up to me to put the warning out when it looks like Jesus is coming, when it looks like that war is getting ready to take place. Guys, I'm telling you, man, we need to be looking up our redemption is drawn near. It is ever so near, man. I'm excited. I'm, vamanos pa la casa, man. I'm ready to go home. Are you ready to go home? <laughs> Look at verse 19 before I get too carried away here. Now when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the young child's life are dead. Then he arose, took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. 
he shall be called a Nazarene. This fills the gap between the time the wise men appeared to worship Jesus, when they gave Jesus their gifts, and the moment years later when John the Baptist announced his arrival to Israel, the return of Joseph and his family to Nazareth. After Herod died in 4 BC, an angel appeared to Joseph in a dream telling him to go back to Israel. Now, Joseph may have thought about returning to Bethlehem in Judah. I mean, no doubt assuming that, hey, this is where Jesus as a descendant of David and Israel's future king should be raised. But he had his doubts. Archelaus, a surviving son of Herod the Great, had come to the throne in Judah and he was known to be just as bad and ruthless as his father, Herod the Great. So while Joseph was considering what to do, God warned him that this actually was a real danger. As a result, Joseph went to Galilee where Archelaus' brother, the Tetrarch Herod Antipas, ruled. This was the last of Matthew's references to the Old Testament right here, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Now, because we don't find a specific verse referring to this prophecy in the Old Testament, we need to realize that Matthew introduces it by referring to prophets, plural, a number of prophets, not one which would indicate a general rather than specific Old Testament reference. Now, when you study Matthew, you have to keep that in the back of your mind. Because remember, Matthew is presenting Jesus as what? His gospel is presenting Jesus as what? The king. The king. He's probably not quoting a specific Old Testament text, but is referring to a general teaching of the scripture. I mean, a right rendering of his words might be this. This was to fulfill the teaching of the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. But here's a problem. Nowhere in the Old Testament do the prophets say this about Jesus, except the fact that Nazareth was a despised place. Now, here's where you got to get into the head of Matthew. <laughs> you got to get into his brain. What Matthew seems to be saying is the prophets predicted the Messiah would be a despised person. He wouldn't be known as Jesus of Bethlehem where David would have been, even though he was born in Bethlehem. Instead, he'd be called Jesus of Nazareth. Now think about this. Remember how Nathanael responded when Philip told him that he, Andrew, and Peter found the Messiah? Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Well, Nathanael replied in John 1.46, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> you get the picture here? Philip said to him, hey, come and see. I used to say that of my church in Adelanto. Adelanto had a lot of meth labs, <laughs> had a couple prisons there and, you know, drug abuse and it was just bad. Adelanto was bad. It wouldn't be a place, if someone wanted to make money, it wouldn't be a place where someone would go. But that's where God called me and that's where I was obedient. And that's where I went and that's where I served for those 17 plus years. That wasn't a ghost, that was Stephanie. She forgot that I'm teaching. Can you believe it? <laughs> Walked right behind me. They'd say, can anything good come out of Adelano, Rick? And I'd say, man, come and see. People are getting saved. People are getting delivered. People are getting healed. People are being transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. God is doing a work in families. He's bringing couples back together. He's bringing families back together. They're being led by the Holy Spirit. They're getting solid in God's word. <laughs> what pastor can ask for anything more? Amen? Matthew was reminding us that the prophets foretold 
the Messiah wouldn't be honored by his people, that he'd be despised. Where do we find that? Isaiah 53, 3. He is despised and rejected by men. It's talking about Jesus, the Messiah, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. You see, this is the thing about studying the word and researching the scriptures. Because if you just read the Bible and you don't have someone to teach it or expound it to you, you're not even going to know what's going on. A lot of people will say, you know what, man, the Bible is full of contradictions. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. Give me a break. January 1st, I started my 43rd time reading through the Bible cover to cover, and there are no contradictions in God's word. It's God's word. I see two great lessons here. First, the sovereignty of God particularly in the details of the birth and life of Jesus, the Messiah. Secondly, the need to confess Jesus as our King and Savior, rather than oppose him like Herod did. Psalm 2, if you get a chance, read Psalm 2. In fact, I just taught a couple months back on Psalm 2. If you go on YouTube and... You go to the search and you put in there Rick Skelton. It'll bring you up to my channel. And all my teachings, I, in fact, all my videos of the entire book of Revelation are on it. These teachings that I'm doing, my midweek Bible study and Matthew are on it. And when I started the Psalms, my teaching on the Psalms are on my YouTube channel. So, I mean, if you know somebody that's not on Facebook and they want to catch up on some studying, go ahead and put, tell them to go on my, my uh, YouTube channel. Psalm 2 is a prophecy of the Messiah. And even though it's not quoted by Matthew, it, it explains what was happening in these events. Psalm 2 describes how the nations of the world conspire and the kings of the earth take their stand against the Lord and against his anointed one. It's exactly what Herod did. It's what people do apart from the supernatural working of the Holy Spirit in their lives. The problem comes down to not wanting Jesus to reign over us. We want to rule ourselves. We want to rule ourselves. But here's what I love about our Lord. He's not losing any sleep over it. <laughs> He's not losing any sleep. When I blow it, when I make, make a mistake and sin or whatever the case might be, Jesus isn't going up there, putting his hand over the Father's eyes and saying, whoops, Rick just messed up. <laughs> wow, that one caught me off guard. No, not a chance, not a chance. Jesus isn't losing sleep over all this rebellion going on on this earth. He knows what's going on. He knows that he's getting ready to come for his bride at any time. He knows that. He knows it's wrapping up just like God knew it was going to wrap up in the world. He knew it was going to be chaotic. All the countries are in chaos. Guys, we are so prime for the return of Jesus Christ for his church. It is unbelievable. It's unbelievable. I mean, you wouldn't know how close we are unless you've read through the scriptures time and time and time and time and time again. You get the whole picture, man. And I'm telling you, <laughs> we, we're at the doorstep. We're at the doorstep. Man, we got to let people know. You know, I'm ready to see our loved ones again. I want to see mom. I want to see mom again. I'm ready. I'm ready to see dad. I'm ready to see my young brother, Wally. My sister, Cindy. Steph's whole family. Steph's mom and dad, her sister, and three brothers. I'm ready. Are you guys ready? You want to see him again? I know you do. How, how much more exciting can this be? 
Psalm 2 is the only place in the Bible where God is said to laugh. God laughs at this folly that's going on in our world today. He's sitting on his throne laughing. <laughs> it's the only place you're going to find it in the Bible. Just over the stupidity of people trying to rebel against him and do their own thing. I mean, it's not a pleasant laugh. It's a scornful, scoffing laugh. God rebukes his rebellious people saying in verse six of Psalm two, yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. You see, God is assuring us his Messiah will be given the nations for his inheritance. He's assuring us of that. And the ends of the earth for the Lord's possession. Verse eight, Psalm two, ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. So what are we to do? Verses 10 to 12 in Psalm two. Now therefore be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, here it is. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. <laughs> it's where my trust is. That's how I can have joy. <laughs> with all hell breaking loose around me, with people that I love leaving, and going to the other side before me. <laughs> no, I'm ready, man. I know you guys are ready too. You see, this is what the rulers won't do. It's why they're in danger of a final and horrific destruction. You know, as I wrap this up, here, here's the warning for you and me. The warning is for us not to be among them not to be among them. One day Jesus will come as the great judge of all. On that day, the wicked are going to be punished. But for us today, thank God it's the day of God's grace. He continues to invite us to come to him. And man, it's a strong reminder that the only refuge from God's wrath it's God's mercy unfolded at the cross of his son, Jesus Christ. If it wasn't for Jesus, guys, we'd be lost. We'd have no hope. Those that have passed, we'd never see them again, ever. There's going to be a familia reunion <laughs> when that trumpet sounds. It could be today. It could be as we're sleeping tonight. We could wake up tomorrow morning and boom, the trumpet and the rapture. It could be any time. We're that generation, and you know what? Think about it. We're at the end of this generation. It began May 14, 1948, when Israel came back into the land. We're close. Guys, be ready. Be ready. If you haven't committed your life to Jesus Christ, you need to pray. You need to ask him for forgiveness. You need to ask him to fill you with the Holy Spirit. You need to surrender your life over to him. And man, you need to start living him for him from now on. It's the only way your name's going to get written in the Lamb's Book of Life. It's the only way that you're guaranteed that you'll go to heaven. You can't just know God. Oh, I know God. I go to church. I grew up, you know, my parents took me to church and I know God. Do you have a relationship with him? If it's a religion thing, that won't get you into heaven. You see, just knowing God won't get you into heaven. What does James says? James says the demons know God and they tremble. Are they going to heaven? Are demons going to heaven? No. Angels are in heaven. Demons are reserved. There's chains of darkness 
that they're reserved for until the judgment to be cast into the lake of fire. It, it's not enough to just know God. You have to ask him for forgiveness. You have to commit your life and surrender your life over to him. And then you have to start living for him every moment of your life. It's the only way. There is no other way. There's only door number one. There isn't door number two or three. It's the only way. Pray. Pray and surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Jesus promises that God will send the Holy Spirit to live inside of you. And that Holy Spirit is your seal until the day either you die and go be with Jesus or Christ comes to meet us in the clouds of the air and we go and be with Jesus. And then he takes us home to heaven for the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's exciting, man. Don't be left behind because all hell. Jesus said it's gonna be so bad. It's never been that bad before and it will never be that bad again as this seven year great tribulation period, which is at some moment in time just before us. And we're gonna be gone before it comes on the scene. I want you to go with us. So be ready. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we do come before you and we thank you for your word, Lord. God, there's so much in your word, Lord. Give us a hunger and thirst for you and your word. And God, continue to teach us. Help us to take these things, build our faith with them, Lord. And uh, Lord, help us be excited. And I do pray for my family here that are watching and listening. Many of us have lost loved ones. And Lord, we know where they're at. We know they're in heaven with you. It's just tough. God, help us not to look backwards as Matthew was pointing out. Help us not to look backwards in sorrow. Help us to look forward to the future and that blessed hope that we have. We're gonna be with you soon. We're gonna be with all of them soon. It is so incredibly awesome. What a blessing to be living at the end of this generation that's going to witness your return. How awesome is that? Father, bless your people. Cause your face to shine upon them, Lord. And Father, I pray, give us a good night's sleep. Wake us up refreshed, ready to go with whatever you have for us. And I pray your blessing on the rest of this week. Prepare our hearts for those who will be watching as we do Psalm 17, as we see David's heart a heart after your own heart, God. We love you and we give you all the glory for it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. I love you guys, man. And I'll see you then or I'll see you in the air. I prefer in the air. <laughs> love you, man.